Pastor, I've heard that Christopher and Dora did a song. Is it, am I correct about that? He did, he did a song. They didn't they really sing it again in a moment. He played for me yesterday. Yes, sir. I, I need that one too. Okay, then we'll get it all set up here. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking about that. I said that was special. I hadn't heard that. I said, I heard about the song that they did sing, but uh, we'll, we'll get that get that done. I, would, I was getting ready to say, uh, we'll have Becky Faith and Hope sing for us, but then I realized there was no, no way to, to give uh, anything to Faith, but that's what we <laughs> Just over there in Jeremiah, when we talk about uh, the, the words of found and I didn't eat them. 
And Lord, you, you showed us how, again, we, we can be encouraged and, and, and we can be sustained. And, and, um, and we find out what your word is because Jeremiah did quit in chapter 20, but all of a sudden he had a fire shut up in his bone. God, you showed me many things. So help us to show some stuff tonight. Nothing new. But please, dear God, nothing new. I pray we don't leave here talking about, oh, man, we found something new. No, we just found something, dear God, that maybe we've been overlooking for a while. And I just pray you bless us. Thank you so much for uh, family singing. I, I didn't ask them to do it earlier. They weren't prepared. But uh, I hope, dear God, that you would uh, bless them. Encourage my heart. Dear. For, dear God, thank you again for the privilege to come now, share your word, teach these your people. I pray that when we leave from here, that we'll be so thankful, as we've been saying, that we came to the house of the Lord. Thank you so much for changing our lives, creating in us, uh, dear God, uh, more of a desire to want to serve you, live for you, and be everything you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Now, I always start off, I told you, we'll be doing this here for a while, and uh, we did it last week, we did it this morning, but I want to remind you of the word of God. God, some things that you and I should have happening because we've been in the Word of God. And if we're not, it's not happening, something's wrong. There's, there's got to be something wrong if we're reading the Word of God and it's not stirring us. It's not creating something inside of us to want to be more of what God will have us to be. First thing I told you this here, from reading the Word of God, there ought to be a thing called conviction conviction. Remember I told you too, there's positive and negatives when it comes to most of us. We just think about sin, but how about get, just knowing more about him? That's what Paul said. Yeah. I, want, I need to know him in, a, in, in, the, in the power of his resurrection. I, I, need, I need to get some better understanding of that. And I need, to, I need to be convicted about the fact that I don't know him like I should. And God is saying, now if it's not some conviction happening, but it positive be a negative, then we ought to ask ourselves about our reading of the Bible. Are we just trying to get through it? Are we spending our 10, 15, maybe some, even a half hour, an hour, and there's never a conviction? Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, sometimes when I'm, when I'm in, in my room by myself, I just have to stop. Why? Because God has done something in my heart. And because of what he's done in my heart, I need to take time and deal with that, which brings us to this here, confession. See, a lot of times, conviction, as a matter of fact, most of us, we just got to be honest. We're just, we're just teenagers in disguise. So, preacher, what do you mean by that? You, you, could, you can get to a teenager, and then you could, you could ask a teenager, did you do that? They won't, they're not going to admit it. In other words, they won't confess it. And, and, and when, you, when you look at them, I'm telling you, you start saying, uh, 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 man, how do, how do they stay so still and so stoned? And really, the truth is, you know, that's, what, that's when you know they did it. They tell on themselves, but they just act like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, w w and, and then it really gets me when they look at you and basically say, you don't have any evidence. <laughs> I wasn't looking for the evidence. I was, I was waiting for you to get honest about it. My dad used to always say, now just tell me the truth and everything will be okay. You know what that really means? Tell me the truth so I can whip you faster. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's, I think that's what some teenagers really think about it. And, and yeah, get it over with. Come on now. But, but God said, when, when it comes to this book here, and again, we come, we're dealing with the sword of the Lord. God said, let me tell me there's no conviction one way or the other. I mean, you're not, you're not get pushing away from stuff or drawing closer. Something's wrong. And then you don't confess, this me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Stand in need of, and then, watch this now. When you have conviction and when you all of a sudden confess it, because you know sometimes people confess stuff, but they don't really mean it. You know, even Pharaoh said, I've sinned. But there was no, here's the last word, change. Most of us, we, take, we, we can say it. It's right there in the book, and I know I should be doing it, but uh, no change. Why is that? Well, I told you this morning, and I'll tell you again this evening. My wife and I have been talking, and we said people, and have you heard me say it, people no longer are sensitive to the Word of God, been desensitized. I mean, it's like so, there's some people, I, I don't know what, I should have looked it up, but you know, I don't know what, what it is when you could take something like put a fire under you and it don't, it don't affect you and stuff. You just can let it just burn. It means skin start melting off. But it, it, no pain. And God has said, that's what I feel like uh, when, I, when, I, when I preach my, have my word preach to people. And there, there's no effect. It's just not, it's not, not, not doing anything. And so, so God, God brings us to this portion of scripture and God is saying, this is the sword of the Lord. It should be doing something. It's two edged. It's, it should be cutting, coming and going. Amen. 
This, this sword right here that, that I've given you should, should cause you to yell out confession. And, and hopefully, listen to it now, it should hopefully cause you to want to change something so you don't have to keep going through that. But that's not what happens many of the time. But, but I sure hope that something will change here today. I hope we'll really be singing and understanding. Yes, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, this book for me. And I stand alone, stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Is that true? Do we really stand on the word of God? The song says, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can we say than to you he have said, to you who, who you for refuge to Jesus have fled? God says you got a firm foundation. You've got his word. And God said it will change your life basically. But what happens today? Uh, most of us, again, nothing. So I want you to get this by way of introduction. And you know what I mean by way of introduction. You turn your paper over and write something down if you want to. God said I want you to get what's happening today. What is that? God said people are reading the word of God. And they were still disobeying. We're hearing it, but we're still disobeying. Now you say, preacher, are you, are you perfect? No, you've heard me say, I'm not perfect. But I sure want to be better. I don't want to be today like I was yesterday, and I don't want tomorrow to be like I am today. Because we all got something we need to deal with. Some change. But God is saying, we're reading the word of God, and, 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 and we're still disobeying. We're still, we're still uh, not be, uh, uh, taking and applying it like we should. Why? Because, again, it just not, don't affect us. Here's another thing I want you to get. We're reading the word of God, and we're still disbelieving, not believing what God said. How is that? You got the book. We told you today, thy word. This is not, this is not my word, not your word. This is God's word. Man, I, I can believe God's word, but we have that problem. And I told you this morning, all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter number three, the Bible says that the devil said, had God said. You know what Eve should have said? Sure right he did. Amen. She, she probably could have said because she wasn't living in this century. She couldn't get that going like that. But she should have said, yeah, that's what he said. And then walked away and left him alone. But what happened is it caused him to start not believing, not believing, not believing. And all of a sudden she said, huh, I, I, can, I got some understanding. Look, look at that fruit. Uh, uh, that stuff probably tastes good. Hmm. And it's going to make me wise too. Hmm. And then she took an ate. But she forgot what God said. The day you eat of the tree, you should surely die. Oh, no, no. Preacher, you don't understand. You, you, don't, you don't get it like I get it. No, you don't get it like the Bible said it. Amen. You should surely die. Children, you disobey your parents. What's going to happen? God says, I'm going to take and cut you short. You won't be prosperous in the land. I just don't believe, I see so many kids disobeying their parents and ain't nothing happened to them. You don't know how, how, how heavy of a heart they have. Yeah. That prodigal son was over there in the hog pen and he said, this is stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And when he finally came to himself, <laughs> that's when things turned around for him. But you know what we have? We, we have? we have something. They don't believe it. Hey, hey not me. Not, it won't happen to me. And God says, you're probably going to be one of the first ones I'll let it happen to. Because if it doesn't happen to you, you're going to be the first one to get away with it. And I'm going to prove to you, you won't get away with it. Somebody help me now. Amen. And so, so we, it, it, disobeying and disbelief. And then watch this now. Somehow we start drifting. We just start drifting. One of the things I found out most of the times, this is here, brother, when people start drifting, somebody, they don't stop. They just get further and further and further away. And before you know it, they're doing more wickedness and wicked, involved in stuff. You're like, what? Didn't we? Did, watch this now. Uh, Mama said, didn't I teach you better? Yeah, you taught me better, but guess what? I'm doing what I want to do. We just start drifting. We just start getting away. And we get so far away that we think we're okay. Or we're going to prove we're right and we can handle it. And that's not just teenagers. That's a lot of people. I heard what the preacher said. I know what he said. But you know what? That's for y'all, not for me. And God says, you don't, you don't get it. This is called the sword of the Lord. There's a reason for it. And in the text, God said it's like a two-edged sword. So I hope you understand this. 
God is saying that, that, that this book right here, it is going to do what I set it out to do. Whether you do it or not. So here's what I want you to get. Disobey, disbelieve, and start drifting. God says, are you with me? You're in danger. You're in some dangerous territory, dangerous waters. God said there's some danger lurking around that corner. But you hear what I'm saying? But here's what we do. Oh, well. Oh, well. And God says, really? Oh, well. And again, most of us, don't, we, we're so desensitized that even when, when, when whatever happens, happens to us, we kind of act like, well, you know, happens to everybody. No, it don't. Hey, Amen. And so, so I want you to understand, when God says it and when God lays it down, God is saying, please follow what I say. Please do what I tell you. Please respond the way I told you to respond. Because when you don't, guess what? The sword is coming out. It's already there and God's already showing it to us. And God is saying, you don't want it to start doing what it can be doing in your life. So we've got to decide something here today. What's that? Oh, I'm, I'm going to take God's word. It, that is the book for me. It's a book I should live by, the book I should stand alone on. It's the book that I should guide my life. Remember, we're going to have our, 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 um, our lives guarded and guided if we'll follow with this book. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, let me just kind of help you a little bit before I get into the message. And uh, I want you to just write it down, if you will, please. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Numbers 13 and 14. Numbers 13 and 14. Preacher, why are you giving us that? Well, I want you to turn to Numbers 14. We'll read something here in just a moment. But in Numbers 13 and 14, God has told the children of Israel, sent them out, allowed them to go out and take a look at the land. And told them that basically, basically what, what God really was doing was say, go and take a good look and, have, have, and, get, and get yourself ready and primed and pumped up. But what happened is they went and they saw what they saw. They saw the grapes and all that stuff. And they, they I mean, they, the land and how the, and, and, but they saw the people. Here's what they said. I know what God said, but we, we can't win that battle. Joshua Caleb said, yeah, we can. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. And the Bible talks about how the 10 took and turned the hearts of the people while the two were saying, man, we can do this. We can do this. And then God, of course, listen to me now, because God wanted them to go in. Are you with me now? God wants us to go into our promised land. God wants us to have victory in our promised land. But what happens a lot of times, we don't have victory and we don't go in and we think it's okay. And God said, but wait a minute, I told you to go in and I'm telling you how to go in, but you don't want to follow my instructions. Are you with me now? Kind of understanding where we're going? And so guess what? So God says, here's what's going to happen. You want to do it your way? Okay, I'm going to let you have your way. Well, what, what's going to happen, dude? What's going to happen, God? God said, remember how you got this here 40? You're going to be 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, whoa, whoa. Well, why did God suffer like that? Because you chose to. For the nail, you chose, you could have been in the promised land. You could be joining milk and honey. You could be eating them big old grapes. I'm telling you something here where, where all you needed was one instead of a whole cluster of them. Come on now. You could have had that, but you didn't want to, so guess what? You ain't getting it, plus you're going to stay out here, and you're going to die in this wilderness. So all of a sudden, the people start saying, man, that's not what we want. Guess how it usually happens. We do what we want to do, and then all of a sudden, we find out how bad it turned out. Oh, that's not what I really wanted. God says, yeah, but you got what you, you know how it is. You, you finally get what you want and don't want what you get. God says, that's exactly what's going on here. Are you still with me now? And so here's what they say. Okay, I know what we'll do. We're going to go in. We're going we're gonna to go conquer the place. And God said, uh, Moses, tell him, mm -mm, it's too late. Mm -mm, mm -mm, don't do that. Don't do that. But they decided they're going to do it anyway. Now look at number, Numbers uh, 14, if you don't mind. Numbers 14 and verse 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and we'll go up unto the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Now look how they said, well, he promised it to us, but we've sinned. Now, I understand, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just forgive us our sin. But they said, he promised it, and we've sinned. So we're going in and get it, because he told us we can have it. Wait a minute, he told you you can have it, but here's one thing that a lot of times don't happen in many of our lives. We don't get right with God. God said, don't go in. They got up and said, we are going in. That ain't getting right with God. That's 
basically telling God, this is what you said I had to do to get it, to go in and conquer it. Now we're going in, and, and now you don't want to do what you said you would do. God said, I told you if you went, you could have it. Now I'm telling you not to go because you can't have it. But we're going to try to force God's hand. So in other words, are you still with me? And Moses said, wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not, what? Go not up. For the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. But the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. You're going to fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. Are you with me still? Now, I want you to see this thing here. So when we get back over to Hebrews chapter number four, when we understand this two-edged sword, we understand so it's not always again about, about God saying, matter of fact, it's a blessing sometimes. But God has said many of us have missed this portion of that thing. It's going to get you. And so they say, uh, he's not with you. Uh, watch this verse 44. But they presumed to go up until the hilltop. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. <laughs> you know what they just basically said here? You're on your own again. Verse 45. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. Wow. What happened? God says, guess what? They died by the sword. You say, but that wasn't the sword of the Lord. Hey, wait a minute. God could have done anything he wanted to when he got ready to. And God sometimes used the sword of an enemy Amen. to help us to see he's not happy with us. Amen. Now, I, like, I really like what, what David said. I'd rather fall into the hand of the Lord instead of the hand of my enemy. I understand that, but sometimes God said, you need to realize something here. That the hand of your enemy is still the hand of the Lord working. So my question to you and I today is this here, is do we really understand when God tells us here about his word being quick and powerful, do we understand God's not playing with us? Amen. And so every time the preacher stands up here, the preacher said, come to the altar, have you fallen under conviction? Come to the altar, won't you confess it to the Lord? Come to the altar and change your life. Come to the altar and become a new creature in the Lord. But many of us, again, we hear the Bible, we read the Bible, but it doesn't affect us at all. I know I don't have anything to change. I'm not coming up there for that. I don't want anybody to know that so God may be working on me. Hey, you lose, not us. So write some things. Are you still okay? Say amen. amen. Write this down. The power of the word. The power of the word. And boy, I sure hope you get these things. Brother Mike, this, this is such a blessing to me. The power of the word. Then write down number two is the piercing of the word. The piercing of the word. I think you saw that in there, right? And then number next, write this down. The preparation by the word. The preparation by the word. And then we'll close it out with a little bit of a little bit of a, um, a conclusion to help you and I understand. God is saying some of us, we, we, listen, to me, we've been hard headed. We've been stiff necked. We've been, we've been disobedient, like I say, disbelieving and drifting. And we've been in danger of having to be dealt with. But God gives us something here at the end and say, you ought to be glad. The children of Israel over in the book of Numbers, they just died. God says, you ought to be glad. Mercy and grace has showed up. Amen. Praise God. Well, what, what, where were we at, preacher? First of all, the power of the word. What makes God's word so powerful? Uh, look at what, the, what it says. For the word of God, the word of God, the word of God what, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God says, did you get that? It is quick. That means it is alive. It is a lie. And, and most of us hear this term about the quick when it comes to getting down to your nail and stuff. And you get down there, most of the time, you can deal with a nail, deal with a nail. But when you get to the quick, you go, oh, because it's a lie. Come on now. And God is trying to give us that same simple understanding that my word is a lie. And my word will cause you to scream out. Come on, help me now, somebody. 
So God said, I want you to understand the power of the word. It is alive, and it is getting down to where it needs to get down to. But what makes God's word so alive? Write this down, first of all, because God's word is given to us by an infallible witness. An infallible witness. God is saying, listen, boy, you got to get this here, Brother Jason. What is that? For the word of God. (laughs) Infallible witness. A lot of times, again, you have people who would talk to you, people who will say stuff, people will talk about they was there, they saw it and stuff like that, and then when they get questioned about it, they say, well, and God say like this, yes, yay, you're right about it, because this is the word of God. God is infallible. God has no, 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 uh, no, no problems in him. There's no character flaw. Hey, come on, help me now, somebody. So when it comes to God's word, all scriptures give my inspiration of God, and it's profitable. God is saying, it's time for you to realize this here. That's my word, and I'm the witness of my word, and my word is true because I am truth. Amen. You need to hold on to that thought here if you don't mind. But God is saying, it, please get a hold of this here. It's an infallible witness. It's the Lord. And it's inspired words. We gave you 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture give my inspiration of God. God tells, tells us again, not one jot nor tittle of his word is going to pass away. God is trying to teach you and I. We have a word that you can stand on. But here's what I'm trying to get to about the powerful and the, the quick and the powerful word of God. Not only do we see the infallible witness, and not do, only do we see this here, here uh, inspired word, but God says, I want you to see what I am doing with my word. What's that? An internal work. The internal work. Now, here's the thing I want you to get. God God is trying to say, this is an internal work. Now, it'll cause some external looks. But God said we're working not from the outside in, but really from the inside. It's quick and it's powerful. And God says when my word gets to working on the inside like it should be, it, it, it energizes it's effective. Come on, somebody. And it will engage you if you will let it. So, God, what are you trying to say? God is saying, I need you to realize something. I didn't just give you a word so you can read it. I gave you a word so it can start doing some things in your life and in my life. But our problem today is this here. We won't let the quick and powerful word have its way in our life. We kind of do like the Holy Spirit. We quench. We take and grieve. We don't walk with what God tells us to walk with. And God said, that is not why I gave you my book so you can just have argument uh, material. But that's what most people have. Oh, matter of fact, there's so many people talk to me. How, how, how you believe? Uh, what, what make you believe the word of God? I believe it because I've studied it a little bit, and I know that God gave it to us, and God does not give us something that's messed up. Yeah. It's just that simple. The one I got it from, the witness, the one, the one who said the word of God, and it's inspired. Again, God is saying, I breathed it out. I gave it to you particularly so you can have it, but there's a work that I want my word to do. Now, here's my question. Is God's re- word really working on us? You say, preacher, I think so. And then God says, okay. Now you understand the power of it. It's effective. It's, it'll engage if you'll let it. But understand how it does it. There's the piercing of God's word. The piercing of God's word. I've, I've said it, so, so I, I shouldn't have to labor here, but somehow it seems like we do. I want you to write down three things real quickly. We're not going to be here long tonight. First of all, I want you to write down here this here. The piercing should bring conviction to the soul. The piercing should bring conviction to the soul. The piercing should bring conviction to the soul. Now, I, well, I sure hope you get this. Why does it not bring that conviction? Are you with me? Because God says we don't, we don't understand how this thing works. So all of a sudden I did a funeral the other day and, and we have funerals and stuff. And uh, when, you have, when you have, remember the word of God, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any two-edged sword. But you take a two-edged sword, I don't care how you sharpen it, I don't know how they do a knife. I don't, I, don't, I don't know anything about sharpening any swords, any edges. 
But I, I tell you one thing I do know. If you sharpen it and give it to me and I go to a dead person and I go. You want to arrest me for humiliating them. Uh, uh, what the kind of, the, uh, the, yeah, that, yeah. But guess what? That dead person go. Oh, 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 oh. I hope you follow me now. God, God said, you want no reason why I don't bring conviction? Because for some reason I'm stabbing dead people. Because if you were alive, are you with me? How many of you think you would feel this? Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? How many of you have felt a paper cut? <laughs> you didn't get it amputated. It got cut a little bit. But God says an alive, come on, help me, somebody. An alive person can feel even a paper cut. Amen. But dead people don't feel anything. And God said that his word, which is quick, which is alive, and which is powerful, is like a sword, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's piercing. And if it's not being effective, God says because that soul is dead. Man, I sure hope you're getting this understanding of what God is trying to teach us here today. There's a lot of folks that claim to be alive in Christ, and God said, you're dead in the world. I dead to the world, but dead in the world. And all he's doing is trying to cut you up to try to help you. We, they don't flinch. Again, just like a teenager. At least the dog on the commercial does this. Hmm? Come on. You know what? Hey, man. And God says, so you just sit there, and when we get done, it's more like this here. Why he messing with me? Why he picking on me? I'm not messing with you. I'm not picking on you. I'm preaching the word of God that should be slicing and dicing. Amen. Yeah. But it's just not happening. Why is that? Are you still with me? Because if it don't bring conviction to the soul, what it does is bring consternation to the sinner, by the sinner, with the sinner. In other words, they get mad. Can you find this out now? Listen to me now. This, this amazes me. Miss Danny, I am not smart. I really am not. But I do learn something. I watch you guys. I listen to you guys. I get a hold of some things. My son, grandson here likes science and stuff like that. And I'm not smart. And he, 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 matter of fact, sometimes when he was in school, he learned something and he want to tell you about it. And I wanna, I'm like this. I don't want to hear it. Because <laughs> they give you every little detail. I don't care because you have a brain. <laughs> but I got a little one too. And if you take and put the sun out, the sun, and you, you put it on, shine right down on wax, what happens? But if you shine, shine that same sun on clay, what happens? God said, listen to me now, those who are alive, they melt under the pressure of the sword. But those who are dead, they, they get hardened. And that's the reason why it's so important. You go back and ask yourself, where am I at in Matthew chapter 13? And God gives it to us in other places. That's when God takes this seed and he puts it in the soil. And what happens here? There's some soil that's so callous, so hard, you can't even get anything in. There's some soil that is so casual, it's stony, and all of a sudden God wants to grow something and nothing begins to grow. Then there's the thorny crowd, there's a, a soil that's all crowded with stuff and God can't get anything in it. But thank God for the soil that gets converted, some 30, 60, and 100 fold. Somebody say amen. And God is saying we need to look at our lives and ask us when the word of God is being preached, do we get a, a frown on our face or do we say, I'm so happy and here's the reason why. Amen. God said my word is not, listen to me, we got it. We have a perfect book. But God is trying to work on some imperfect people. And he says, it only works as long as you let him do it. My son, give me thine heart. And God said, because I'm not going to take it. But if you give it to me, 
I'll mold you and make you into what you ought to be. Amen. What's our problem today? God is saying we don't get it. As a matter of fact, write this verse down so some of you can get where we're at here today. In this room even, that's Matthew 15, verse number 8. God says, there's people draw nigh me with their mouth but, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is so far from me. Say, preacher, what are you trying to say? I, I'm not, listen, the one thing I hope you'll get a hold of this. I do know things in life. I understand that. I'm the pastor. But I stand up here and preach because we all need it. And some people say, he's preaching right at me. And let me tell you what, what, what I'm telling you. Not on purpose, but if I am, good. Because it's the word of God. And God's word should right now be piercing. Should be bringing conviction to the soul instead of consternation as a sinner. And watch this. Are you still with me? Which brings about a conversion because of you're a saint. And most of people, again, listen to me now. When I say you're a saint, you really want it. I want to know what thus says the Lord. Watch this now. Psalm 19, verse 7. I had so many other verses, but I'll just give you this one here. The Bible said, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Whew. But it's not the way it is with some of us. Most of us, we hear the word of God, and it just kind of makes us mad. Acts 7, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut. Because you do get cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Wait a minute. You, you got cut to your heart and you start biting on the preacher? Yeah, go ahead. We are like, why? He said. And they got even worse than that, Brother Mike. That's Acts 7 54. And then you go to first 57, the Bible says here. Then they cried out with a loud voice. You know what that means there, Brother Jason? Cried out with a loud voice? Ah! Now, I know you don't do that in here while I'm preaching, but somehow on the inside, you get a little noise going on. You can't hear anything the preacher's saying. Wow. And he said they stopped their ears. The noise gets started, the ears get stopped, and then what happened? They ran upon him with one accord. Thank God you don't come and jump on me up here. <laughs> and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him, and the witnesses laid uh, down and, and let down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. In other words, Saul said, Get him. Matter of fact, it's amazing to me how when people, some people don't like what God is saying, they always find somebody else who doesn't like what God is saying and say, join us as we take in. God said, it's time for us to say, you know what, God? I want your word. Are you still with me? Your word will pierce, and I need to let it pierce, and I need to let it have its way in my life. When God's word pierces right, according to Acts 2, the Bible said they gladly heard his word. The ones who gladly heard his word, what happened? They were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know how I know again God words sometimes don't work? Because you, cause, cause you got to do this now. I don't think most people understand this here. A lot of times we've been so deep in what we do. God says you need to stop and ask somebody who you trust to give you the word of God. What do I need to do? But no, we can justify ourselves. I've read the Bible too. I know, and you twist it to the way you want it to be for you. The preparation. Are you still okay? I know I am. <laughs> God tells us now in verse number 13, neither there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Preparation of God's word. God says, now understand something here. Are you still with me now? Amen. God says, first of all, I want you to get this about the Lord. First of all, is his omnipresence. His omnipresence. God says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. In other words, if everybody's manifest in his sight, he sees it all. Omnipresent. He's there with everybody. The eyes of the Lord, Proverbs 15, 3, are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Omnipresence of God means you and I are not getting away. No, and God, does not, I may not see it. Parents may not see it. Friends may not see it. But God says, I see it all. The omnipresence of God. I don't do we see the omnipresence of God, but how about this here? The omniscience of God. What do you mean by the preacher? He knows everything. And let me tell you how much he knows it. He says it's naked and open unto it. There ain't nothing covered up. It's naked and open. Like, ah! Oh! God said, I, I saw that too. 
<laughs> the question is, do you ever want God to catch you doing something that you ought not to be doing? How many say, yeah, I don't want God to ever catch me doing something I shouldn't be doing? Amen. And God says, caught you already because I'm omnipresent and omniscient. But we don't think about, come on, we don't think about that. And because we don't think about that, God's word is not having the effect on us that it should. All of a sudden, somebody goes in the store and takes something, put it in their pocket and walk out. Then they get home and they take it, maybe say it was a candy bar, and they eat it. And they say, I got away with that. God says, no, I was right there when you took it, and I saw you do it. It was naked and open before my eyes. God says, stop thinking that you and I have gotten away with it. Ecclesiastes 8.11 tells us the reason why we keep doing stuff because we don't get judgment or sentence speedily. But well, God said, don't worry, it's coming. We'll get into that in just, are you still with me? So God says, I'm omnipresent, I'm omniscient, and I'm omnipotent. Watch this now, with whom we have to do. God said, you say, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what God has said, I'm your final judge. Whoa! Yeah. Yes, I saw it all. I was there when you did it. And now you got the answer to me. With whom we have to do. Yeah. Now here's our biggest problem. Most of us don't see the reality of God's judgment. Is that preacher, I'm saved. I'm not going to the great white throne. I ain't say you were going to the great white throne judgment. But I tell you one thing here. You may not go to the great white throne judgment. God may have to stay for mama's judgment. That's his judgment. Say, you're going to wish you hadn't. The really reality of the judgment. And then God said, understand something. When, when the judgment comes, there will be the revelation in the judgment. I'm not going to take and say, you did this and you didn't do it. Or you did this and you didn't do it. I'm going to talk about everything. Or I'm going to show everything. You, you, God said, you need to be prepared. It's coming. Remember, I'm omnipresent. I'm and I, omniscient and omnipotent. Okay, God. Reality, the revelation of it. And then God says, and I know you don't want me to review it. You really don't want me to review it. Write this down so we can understand that God does not take and hold you accountable for stuff you didn't do. Galatians 6 verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, God's not deceived. God's not tricked. God's not fooled. For whatsoever man soeth, that shall he also reap. So God said, when we review it, guess what? You're not going to say, oh, it wasn't fair. God says, everything about it is fair. Amen. So God, what do I need to do? Because some of us have been ignoring God's word. Here's what God says. Now we're done. Are you, are you, aren't you glad we're done? Amen. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest. We have what? Great high priest. What did the high priest do? The high priest took and made sure that all the sins were being atoned for. Come on now. We got a great high priest. We got a better than what they had. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, heaven, he's sitting there. He's sitting at the right hand. The, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest. In other words, he understands, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. We like to t preach that dealing with God knows what you're going through. He knows the feelings of our infirmity. Yet, now watch this now. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I know you read that. I read it. I preached it. But God said, I need you to get this here. You got somebody, because he came to this earth. He went through all the stuff you had to go through. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows that we fall into it, but he didn't do it. So here's what he says in verse 16. So let us, therefore. Well, therefore. What is it there for? Because what I said over there, now we can go forward over here. What we're going to do? Therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What's that? When we haven't been listening, we've been disobeying, disbelief, drifting, and now have fallen in danger of the discipline of God. God, what am I going to do now? God said in verse, are you still with me? Come boldly unto the throne of grace. What for? So you may obtain mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. When my word's been cutting and finally you are bleeding, God says, come to my throne so I can patch you up. But if you want to stay out there, you can do that. Here's what he says. Come to me. I'm living. Come to me. I'm loving. And come to me because I'm life-giving. 
I'll say it again. Come to me because I'm living. God, we're not going to a dead God. Come to me because I'm loving. He's been touched. He understands. But come to me because I'm life-giving. You have been ignoring my word. And I can help you through it now. I hope everybody in here will say, God, I'm convicted about the way I've treated and responded to your word. I come now to confess it. And I need now with a change in my life. Father, thank you so much for the great truth. Bless it now we pray. Please, in Jesus' name. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's all stand.